Pippa's Road Trip For Pippa By the Capipolists Introduction Quote Pippa is on her own spectrum End quote Tenma Miami, 2024 Ahead are five stories and some poems each written by a faithful Capipolist They're ordered by location but there's no chronology no overarching plot they're narratives about the idea of their Pippa on a road trip. Their points of view are just pieces of the whole. The traits they want to emphasize. The expressions are, I might say, masks that she wears on the digital stage. Each depiction might be called Pippa the Bold, Pippa the Child, Pippa the Maniac, Pippa the Sweetheart, or Pippa the Thoughtful. A compelling actor is authentic. It's not a funny voice, a blatant sexuality, or a mental illness that compels. There are easy audiences for such things, but those elements are not present. What, then, is the authentic Pippa? I don't know. Who am I to say such a thing? I am merely the son of a song, a spirit of words. And you, dear listener, are my treasured companion in this river of ink. If you'll have me, let's read the stories together and see what we find. A Sonnet for Solace Within the center was the thought conceived, that broader country was there left to see, and thus my melancholy was relieved, that I would wander in my search for thee. But who are you, and what thy given name? How hungry for a character are we! A hundred thousand names would be the same to glean the meaning of the land we see. A setting carries soul in life or death, the wettest forest or the driest sand. But solace found in stillness and in breath imprints the memory of where we stand. A mirror held for nature's form to show, so all our shadows we may come to know. Pippa Goes to Florida by Tangenterines. One stormy evening, Pipkin Pippa was driving her RV through the Florida Everglades. She peered intensely through the curtain of rain, her headlights piercing the night. He's gotta be somewhere! I didn't come all the way down to Florida to not see the Florida man! Pippa muttered to herself. Pippa spent the past three days in the state gathering all the information she could about the infamous Florida man. She had a disorganized pile of notes, blurry photographs, and mismatched map fragments that all pointed her to this swamp on this particular evening. The hunt was on, and she had the tools of the trade. Pippa's RV was built tough. It tread over rocks, branches, and mud as if they were nothing. Her lights cut through the fog and the wipers peeled away the rain. Nothing could stop Pippa. Until a possum scurried across the dirt road. Pippa would never hurt such a creature, so she swerved left, and then she swerved right, until a loud pop and a heavy thud rang out. The rain stopped, and all was silent in the misty darkness. While the possum was safe, Pippa could not say the same for her vehicle. She'd blown a tire, and the whole van was stuck in a ditch. Stupid possum, you little... Pippa grumbled, muttering a few expletives under her breath. She needed a new tire to continue her search, which she didn't have. Pippa took out her cell phone to call for help, but to no avail. No service. The inside of the RV was a bigger mess than usual. Pippa rummaged through her pile of soda cans for a flashlight and a camera. A normal person would follow the signs back to a park ranger station, but not Pippa. She greedily took out her mess of notes, intent on finding the Florida man. According to her notes, she was close. A left at the big tree stump shaped like a foot, a right by the lake with the colorful mushrooms, and voila! Pippa was stuck in the middle of nowhere. No Florida man to be found. Florida man! Where the hell are you? Stupid! Pippa shouted into the fog and kicked a branch into the bayou, dousing herself with stinky creek water. As Pippa wiped the water from her eyes, she stepped onto something strange. 
Was that a foot? Were those claws? She forced her eyes open to see a stranger in the night. His skin was as pale as a sheet from malnutrition. His teeth were rotting yellow from either meth or Mountain Dew. His wardrobe was equally perplexing. A winter Ushanka with a Hawaiian shirt, ripped booty shorts, and mismatched sneakers. Slung over his shoulder was a massive sack, large enough to fit a human body. But most shocking of all was the ferocious alligator he was mounted on. <laughs> Roared the stranger and his gator. He flailed his gangly arms towards Pippa like a feral cat, but she ducked out of the way. Lord, I'm in! Pippa screamed in excitement. She'd found her quarry. She was so excited, she lifted her camera and took a picture with a flash. <coughs> the Florida man and his gator howled back, blinded by the light. This time the alligator lunged right for Pippa, missing her by a hair. Stand still, I can't get this photo. Pippa chided, oblivious to the incoming apex predator. The gator snapped her jaws at Pippa. Pippa took a look at her camera's screen. The last thing she had caught was the ferocious gator's open maw. Slowly the pieces clicked together as Pippa gradually looked up at the furious man before her. The sense of danger finally sunk in. Run! Pippa yelled. Behind her, the Florida man and his alligator gave chase. Oh. <laughs> Get back here, you! <laughs> the raving lunatic yelled in the distance. Pippa could barely run in the water sloshing up to her knees, but the Florida man's alligator ripped through the waves. Pippa needed an idea quickly. She found a branch and bent it back with all her might. The Florida man made a headlong charge, and with a loud thwack, Pippa let go, slamming the branch right into the alligator's snout. With a healthy lead, Pippa scrambled onto a dock. There was a gift shop by the pier. Pippa dove inside and hid among cute plushies of all the Everglades critters. Florida Man entered soon after, carefully surveying the interior. When he came up to the stuffed animals, he noticed one of them was a rabbit. Did rabbits even live in the Everglades? The man poked the tummy of the pink bunny. <coughs> went Pippa, who toppled the pyramid of plushies on him and ran out of the shop. Just a little more. Hopefully Pippa could lose the Florida man and find help. Rangers, police, anyone, except the feds. She saw a light in the distance while she dashed through the swamp. Ha ha, see ya, Florida freak! Pippa yelled behind her, but no one was there. And the light was getting brighter and closer. The Florida man was riding a high-speed airboat toward her, and with a deft hand, scooped Pippa up by her hoodie and tossed her onto the deck. Well, now I finally caught you. He reached into his bag. Pippa braced herself. Was it a weapon? No. It was a brand new tire. Whew. <laughs> ah. I saw you blew a flat. <laughs> Pippa stared at him, dumbfounded. The Florida man led his gator companion to Pippa's RV and the formidable reptile got it out of the ditch with one powerful shove. The stranger fitted the new tire, and Pippa was ready to drive again. Wow. Thanks, mister. I'm sorry about all that. Pippa held out one of the plushies she had pelted the Florida man with as a peace offering. Ah, oh, don't worry about it, missy. At least Joanne and I can dizzle back to the highway. The Florida man pet his gator, who purred cheerfully. Wait till everyone hears about how I outsmarted the Florida man. That was a joke, by the way. Can I get your photo? Pippa was bragging again as she saw the park's exit and the sunrise. But when Pippa looked behind her to thank the Florida man one last time with a photo, there was nothing behind her but the morning haze. The end. A sonnet for Florida man. Oh, you bewilder me with how you live. So I approach this danger to explore. My broad assumptions may you please forgive, but be it true, your strangeness I adore. I laugh at judgments that you weirdly make, eccentric and bizarre, but humankind. Surprise my sense, reveal my dark mistake, 
and my assumptions will I then rewind. Though curiosity may kill a cat, surviving in a swamp will make us strange. We merely meet each other where we're at, and in between the moments where we change. I cherish all the words from out your mouth, reminding me of my beloved South. Pippa Goes to Virginia by Tamamo Respector Pippa and Jelly nearly pressed their faces to the rear window, watching the sun shrink to nothing behind the car. They descended deeper beneath the waves, with only artificial light to guide their descent. The sounds around them began to take on a curious, echoing quality. Jelly, are we gonna drown? Pippa started up fearfully. Nah, we'll be fine. A lot of engineers make sure this thing is strong enough. People use this all the time. Jelly replied, a slight quaver in her voice. The two girls' gazes slid to meet each other, and the apprehension each was feeling stoked the fear of the other. Will you two calm down? Lumi sighed from the driver's seat. It's just a tunnel. Thousands of people go through it every day, and half for decades now. We're perfectly safe. The trio neared the bottom of the tunnel, and traffic began to slow. Pippa whipped to face Lumi. And what if it collapses? Right now, we're at the bottom. If any part of this collapses, there's no way we get out in time. We're fucking dead, Lumi! She cried, a slight mania creeping into her eyes. Lumi simply sighed, let Pippa rant, and began the ascent. Slowly, the sun came into view. Finally, they emerged from beneath the waves back into the sun, Pippa's frantic ranting continued for a few moments more until the realization that they were out of the bridge tunnel set in. Pippa, we're out of the tunnel. He can stop, Jelly said, resting a hand on her shoulder. Pippa felt her pounding heart settle and lowered slowly back into her seat. She crossed her arms over herself with a huff. Well, we could have. No one that dies in an accident thinks they will until it happens. Pippa, this is just plain paranoia, and you know it, Jelly said. We got through, and we're fine. The tunnel will continue to be fine. Calm down. We'll be at the museum soon. Pippa gazed out the window and watched the sign roll past. Welcome to Newport News. Lumi pulled the car into the museum parking lot and threw it into park. She leaned over the seat to face the two passengers in the back seat. All right, first stop, the Virginia Living Museum, she declared. She pulled the keys from the ignition, almost tossing them to herself as she palmed them and dropped them in her purse. Pippa and Jelly each climbed out of their respective sides of the car, taking the opportunity to finally stretch their legs. Jelly glanced back towards her friends while arching her back and noticed them walking in without her. She stumbled as she started after them to catch up. She fell in alongside her friends, stepping up to the ticket counter. Pippa and Jelly stared wordlessly at the man behind the ticket counter. Lumi looked down at her tight-lipped friends and sighed. <sighs> Three adults, please. She grabbed the tickets and handed one each back to Pippa and Jelly. Thanks, they murmured in unison. The trio walked onward out the door to the exhibits, their pace slowly increasing until they reached their destination. When the first exhibit was in sight, they broke their silence. <coughs> the three squealed in unison, leaning over the railing to look at the creatures. The pair of river otters were floating on their backs, showing only a minor reaction to the three women clamoring above them. Look at them! Jelly squealed. I know! <laughs> Lumi concurred. They're so fucking cute! Pippa screeched. They fawned over the otters for a few minutes more before breaking to look at the other exhibits. They scurried about, converging and diverging on different animals in the glee at the sheer variety. Pippa was listening intently to a guide holding an owl out and a thick leather glove when she felt a hand on each of her shoulders. She gave a frantic glance over each shoulder, barely restraining herself from crying out in shock. Her momentary panic died down when she realized it was only Lumi and Jelly, each having clapped a hand on one of her shoulders. We really lost track of time, Lumi said. 
I'm not sure we'll have time to go to the Mariner's Museum. The sag of Pippa's shoulders betrayed her disappointment. She'd been so excited for a museum that they now might have to skip. Seeing a solution, Lumi perked up. Hmm. You know what? I'll do you one better. Back to the car! She said, leading the way at a light jog. A breathless Pippa made it back to the car behind her two companions. This better be good, she panted, flopping into the passenger seat. She grew increasingly apprehensive as Lumi drove them up to a checkpoint. Oh, oh, oh! Stop right there! The guard called out. Oh my god! Are we not supposed to be here? We're so lost! Please, can you help us figure out where we need to go? Lumi whimpered. The guard came around to help, but before the guard could answer, Lumi pulled out her phone, shoving a navigation app in his face. She slipped out the car, feigning incompetence and leading the guard back to his post. The guard's body language gradually loosened. Taking advantage of his trust before he could think better of it, Lumi grabbed a paperweight and bashed him over the back of the head with it. Seizing the moment, Lumi took the initiative to strip him of his uniform. She rolled the sleeves and pat legs in to fit her, and ushered Pippa and Jelly out of the car. Shh. Okay, keep up. And look like you're supposed to be here, she said, leading them onward. Lumi led the group, using the failing light to avoid suspicion. Finally, they stopped in front of a twilit titan. Silhouetted against the sunset was the enormous hull of the Gerald R. Ford class carrier that would bear the name Enterprise. So, Pippa, is this good enough for you? Pippa stared silently at the ship, the swarm of relative insects that crawled over it during the day having retired for the night. A single tear dripped from her cheek. It's Enterprise, she whispered. Pippa, what are you talking about? I thought you loved Bismarck, Jelly asked. Besides, Civil Six has been decommissioned for decades. What opportunity would I ever have to see either? Pippa responded. Besides, Bismarck may be my wife, but Enti is my concubine. It's not the same ship, but she carries the name and the spirit of her record. This is closer than most would get. She leaned in, running a hand down the ship's hull. Her voice cracked a bit as she turned to Lumi. Thanks. I don't think I'd have ever gotten this opportunity otherwise. Lumi watched Pippa's romantic moment with a hundred thousand tons of metal in utter confusion, but she was happy for her friend. Okay. I'm glad you're happy, Pippa. But we need to go. That guard is probably coming too. Pippa nodded in agreement and followed Lumi in retracing their path. Back at the checkpoint, Lumi changed back into her clothes and sped back out to the road. Welp, we're driving for a while now. That was just a tiny bit of a federal crime. <laughs> Lumi made her way out to 64, buckling in for a long drive. The End A Sonnet for a Ship I am but weak before the open sea, beholden to the ship that carries me. The sailors sing their body tunes with glee, and yearn the ladies taking up their fee. But none are truer than this navy boat, which ventures through the storms from port to port. With pride I wear the badges on my coat, and show my character to whom I court. No love is permanent, but hold it well. An anchor may we find in closest friend. At every stop another tale to tell, which will continue to the ocean's end. I am but weak before the open sea, beholden to the ship that carries me. Pippa Goes to Washington, D.C. by Deslaris A certain sign caught Pippa's eye as she passed through the District of Columbia. It read, National Zoo. She immediately changed course, followed the signs, parked the unruly RV in the cramped National Zoo lot, and rushed out of the vehicle. There was plenty to do and see, from pressing her face against the glass at the Reptile Discovery Center, to climbing the rails at the Elephant Trail, to cheering the gorillas in the Great Ape House, and fawning over every animal in the Small Mammal House. 
From exhibit to exhibit, eyes lit up, ears perked, and tail wiggling under her sweater, she caught the attention of the other patrons. Of course, she felt the eyes on her, but she tried to ignore it. After all, a pink-haired rabbit girl visiting a zoo was inherently strange. But she didn't anticipate someone recognizing her. So shocking it was that she had pulled her gun on the person the moment her name was called out. The person found themselves in the unenviable position of hostage, or as Pippa called him, her faithful local tour guide. With the pressure on to please the rabbit, who was more than happy to draw her gun and make threats, the tour guide thought quickly. What to do when you're in D.C. with a violent rabbit who has threatened to kill you and your family? You go to the optimal and most central location, the Washington Monument. The highest point between the plethora of museums and government buildings where you can look out and see a vast stretch of the city. Pepper was stunned, in awe of the sight before her. Seeing the museums all laid out before them, she wistfully whispered her desire to visit all of them. Not realizing the danger that came with this statement, the tour guide informed her that the majority of the museums were free. This sealed his fate for the next few days. With her spirit kindled and passion in her eyes, she set a course for the American History Museum. The first exhibit to catch her attention was the Hall of Presidents. More specifically, the section on deaths while in office. She focused on the John F. Kennedy section, rambling somewhat loudly in the middle of the exhibit about the grassy knoll, the impossible shots, and how the exhibits didn't tell the truth of the situation. Trying to steer the conversation elsewhere, the tour guide explained how all the exhibits were set up in a similar manner. The gears spun in the rabbit's head and suddenly it hit her. So if there's not much information in the museums themselves, that means you gotta go home and do your own research, right? Sure, rabbit, the tour guide humored her. Then everyone goes home and looks up what they found the most interesting. But what happens when that person is a VTuber or any kind of content creator? They do it in a stupid manner. No, shut up, dumbass. They make a video about it. A deep dive even. Then they get to show off what they learn to their audience or their chat. So, if you think about it, this is actually a great way to come up with new content. Uh-huh. Isn't that what students do? Pippa was dumbfounded. You go to a museum, find a topic, do more research, then make a presentation to your class. What are you on about? I'm just saying. Y'all are basically just making glorified school reports, right? No. Oh god, we are! After distracting Pippa with an existential crisis, the tour guide rerouted them away from the museum and brought her to the U.S. Capitol building. The rabbit couldn't resist the temptation of replicating a certain moment, so she took a short stroll to the top of the steps, only to be turned back by security. They weren't doing public tours that day. Pippa returned to the tour guide, grumbling her desire to return on a certain anniversary. When they arrived at the White House, Pippa didn't hide her surprise, her bewilderment, or her disgust. The sight before her was wild and ridiculous. All around them were people protesting, chanting, or simply yelling wildly into the air. The White House itself was beautiful. It had a wonderfully kept lawn, a vibrantly white building, and snipers on the rooftop. It was a sight to behold, but Pippa was a little caught off guard by the rest of it all. There wasn't much else to be said or seen, so they moved on after capturing a few pictures. The tour guide was tasked with one more job. Pippa asked him for a hug. It was a trick. She turned the hug into a headlock, and dragged him towards their true final destination, the ATF headquarters. There was no actual goal to it. Pippa simply wanted to make a wonderful memory for herself. This was a simple challenge, as agents poured out and surrounded the pair the second they were spotted. The standoff lasted for all of five minutes before the rabbit made her demand. An Azure Lane Bismarck body pillow. By some odd turn of events, an agent actually had one in their possession. With the exchange of the hostage for the body pillow, Pippa informed them that the hostage was a wanted terrorist that she managed to capture. It was a lie, but it distracted them enough to give her a moment to slip away, her new body pillow in tow. The End A Sonnet for Politics I wear a mask, conveying manic rage. It serves me well to draw an eager eye, 
Emotions in extreme persist in age, manipulated by the slick and sly. I use the mask to relish what is fake, to have an outlet for a full release. Pretenders bicker on the laws to make, but plan on how constituents to fleece. The symbols of the party make a zoo, and each election bubbles rage anew. With constant war for enemies to rue, we cast aside the values that are true. Like tourists, we are captured by a frame, and for our troubles have ourselves to blame. Pippa Goes to New York by Berserk Rage Pippa is currently sleeping in her magic RV, all cozy and comfy from having this amazing adventure so far. The RV's autopathing is running, letting it choose her next destination on its own. She figured that just once. Gambling for a cool or wonderful stop is more exciting if she doesn't know where or what it's going to be. As the RV reaches its next destination for Pippa to explore, it gives a very loud honk to rouse the sleepy rabbit from her slumber. Or it tries to rouse her, but the RV is well acquainted with this rabbit's antics. It turns on the radio loudly to Pippa the Ripper, much to the rabbit's dismay. Ah, turn it off already! I get it! I'm up! She grumbles and glares at the dashboard. Okay, so where are we this time? She makes her way out the door and encounters a very unusual sight for her. She sees a bunch of huge and colorful blocks interconnected with each other, and various giant pieces that she remembers from certain board games, one of them being Scrabble tiles that spell out the word play on them. All of this surrounds a huge building with a big sign to the side of a big glass enclosure that looks like a forest, and she can make out various butterflies fluttering about in it. Oh, this actually looks really cool. Let's see here. She looks up at the sign to read. The Strong National Museum of Play? Huh. Well, I like playing a lot, so this is right up my alley! She spots the entrance nearby and heads on in, eager to see what the museum holds. Pippa explores the museum's array of colorful and interactive displays at her leisure. Each corner she turns and every hall she goes down has something she can look at or interact with. She walks along Sesame Street and Elmo's world, wide-eyed and in awe of how accurate it looks. She then hurries to the pinball playfields and tries to become a pinball wizard. She moves on to the arcade and console corner, admiring video game history. She plays many different games, some she remembers from when she was a little bunny, some that she's never even heard of, but all are thrilling or pleasant. She wanders in the butterfly garden and aquarium, admiring the bugs and fishes that she so adores. She goes to the Toy Hall of Fame and marvels at the different and wonderful toys that have been made over the years, and even plays with a few of them. At least, the ones she can play on her own. She briefly peeks at the board game area and realizes that she probably can't do much outside of admiring them. After a few hours of exploring the museum, she rests outside near the magic RV. She feels strangely unsatisfied. Man, if only I could show Mechan and the others this place and play with them. I'm sure they'd enjoy it just as much, if not more than I have. The RV, taking this as a sign of sort, honks and speeds off, much to Pippa's surprise. Instantly, it returns as if no time has passed. The doors open and she hears the voice of a very familiar fox. Pippa Chen, why did you run up on your own without us again? It was Tenma popping out first, with more movement behind her from other girls. Clara says excitedly, Woohoo! I'm heading off to play with the Loki dolls in the comic exhibit! Behind her, Leah and Jelly shout over who will be the dog in Monopoly. No, I get the dog because I'm Leah. You can't use the I'm Leah excuse every time! It doesn't work that way! It does because I'm Leah! This continues as every friend from Faze exits the RV, all gazing excitedly at the museum. Pippa's shock melts into happiness as Tenma addresses her again. So, Pippa, anything you do want to do together? I'm sure you got a few games in mind for us all, right? Pippa smiles. You have no idea, Mi-chan! Come on! We 
can start with the board games first. They're enough for everybody. Sweet. <laughs> Pippa leads the large group around for another go at the museum's activities, only now with more bantering, bullying, and chaos, as you'd expect to happen from these girls being together. Pippa looks at the girls and the smiles and the laughs and comes to a conclusion. One she starts saying out loud without thinking. You know, I thought playing with games and toys was fun, but I guess the real fun is the joy of sharing those games and toys with friends you love and care for. The girls stop what they're doing to look at Pippa as she contemplates her thoughts, until Tenma speaks up. Pippa, what is wrong with you? You sound like a cheesy after-school special. They all laugh at Tenma's response while returning to the RV, which makes Pippa sheepish. But then Tenma gets closer to Pippa and whispers, But, you know what? You're not wrong at all! I agree with you! She winks at her. The magic RV honks to get Tenma's attention while she hugs her friend. See you next time, Pippa! Let's play some more, okay? The RV takes everyone home in a flash and instantly returns for Pippa to continue her adventure. Okay, this worked out. So, Magic RV. Oh, you're stuck again. I'm gonna go take a nap. Pippa barely stifles a yawn as she's tired from the day's events. The Magic RV takes off to her next destination, where she will encounter more wonderful experiences. The end. A Sonnet for Play I play pretend, a game with rabbit ears, but bring myself to every role I play. A rabbit full of courage, full of fears, and thankful I can live another day. To be alone may not require shame, but still I'm trying harder making friends. Considering the purpose of my name, I want for them some happiness to send. I'll take a picture of this day to share and buy some merchandise to best display. For years I'm slowly learning better care, so I can live the best a rabbit may. A moment's rest and play reveals the truth, how much we treasure from our days of youth. Pippa Goes to the Wilderness By Orange Crowbar Man Two roads diverged in a springtime wood, and Pippican Pippa took the road more traveled. Not because she was in a hurry, no, nor was she possessed by some wild animus to take the more trodden path. In fact, one might suggest that while the path more traveled was the easier of the two, it has become such for a reason. For her, at least, it was none of those things. It was the soft bubbling of the brook beside the path that enticed her so. The stream, as it were, seemed to stretch forever and as she followed it and bathed in the gentle warmth of the sun through autumn trees, she felt at home. The forest and its denizens were known to her. Not everyone, no, but the multitude she understood. She was a creature of it, after all, and while time passed, she would always know them. Though she would travel to far-off lands and jungles made of stone, her home and heart would always be with them. She likes to think they were as comforted by this fact as she was. It wasn't the stream that enticed her, for no streams truly did, but the gentle waters did lap appealingly and feed into a small pond ahead. The diminutive pond was pure and welcoming. She could see some small fish darting here and there, and as the wind softly blew she could faintly hear the sound of ducks in the distance. Above her was an endless, cloudless sky, breathtaking to behold, and of the deepest and most honest azure. The Lord might himself even pause and appreciate. A perfect, timeless day, during a perfect, timeless summer, in which she found herself now, carried as if by whim of fate, at the edge of the lake. Had she the wherewithal, she mused to herself, it might be a perfect spot for a picnic with the others, Tenma, Leah, Uruka, Nasa, Michiru, any and all of them surely would have appreciated such a vista. But it was not to be today, for while her journey did take her here, it had taken her here alone. Nature, fate, or God Almighty, whichever it was, had seen fit that she arrive at this time and place, alone save for her thoughts. 
She didn't recall where she had read it or heard it, but she understood that the brain scooped thoughts at random, much like an angel might pluck a soul from the vast sea of the unconscious to inhabit a body. These thoughts, these feelings, often random as they were, were simultaneously dreadfully serious and pointlessly stimulating. When a new thought bubbled up from the brook in front of her, or from her subconscious, she wasn't sure what to make of it. A half-remembered quote sprung to mind. A man may not drink from the same river twice. When she had heard this the first time, she didn't understand it. You might take a sip from the same stream. It's not like it went anywhere in the seconds that it took to take a sip. And yet now, before the endless sky and cool waters, the errant, angelic, beautiful and fickle neurons decided to make the connection. Change. Change would come. Change did come. As the river continues to flow as you take a sip, it would never be quite the same river as the one you sipped before. She knelt down then, low to the earth, and cupped her hands. She drew up a small amount of water and drank. It was cool and crisp, refreshing to both the touch and taste. There was a purity here. A purity of purpose and of intent. Change may come, as it must, like a river must continue to flow. But in the quiet moments there is peace. Streams may lead to anywhere, places good and places bad, but they always flowed onward. They never stopped. As she sat beside the lake and drank, she mused that she must as well. Onward. Keep pushing. Keep trying. Keep moving forward. She was reluctant to get up, to leave behind the pure waters and the open skies and the warmth that they gave. She had become reticent in her solitude, withdrawn but not forlorn, perhaps for the first time in a long time at peace with herself. Her friends would be wondering where she was soon, she thought to herself. The dreamlike quality of this earthy oasis seemed to fade as the thoughts of the future and of others began to creep back in. However, as they arrived, these thoughts bore no malice, nor dark clouds. Her friends would miss her, her people would miss her, and so she must return. There would be good times and bad, but there they would weather whatever trials may come together. The remainder of the trail, as long as it was, blurred before her. Her mind wandered as she walked, but never far. Soon she'd leave this place and be on her journey once again. From places unknown to parts even more unknown. But there was a beauty in that simplicity. She had been refreshed by the stream and the calm waters that it had fed. She had drank deeply but wisely. Not like Narcissus, no. She had seen her reflection in the lapping of the waves and grown wiser. Vanity had no place in her. For what could it grasp hold of? She was a simple creature of the lush forest and open sky, of the open roads and of good friends and good times. She was not one for what could have been, only what was and what could be. A road of endless possibilities, traveling under an open sky. That is who she was, and how she drove forwards. As she approached the car, her phone rang softly. Another indicator that her saccharine dream had ended. Where are you? We've been waiting on you for an hour, Pipaton. Are you wasting time again with some bullshit? She couldn't help but laugh to herself, much to the chagrin of the fox on the other end of the line. No, no, me, Jen. I'm on the way. I just had to take a slight detour for a little while. Road work or something. I'm back on the main road, and I'll be there soon. She didn't listen much to the response but ended the conversation gracefully and drove on. The future awaited. The end. A Sonnet for Home When I return, what change will be in me? Will they be proud of what I chose to do? I've gone so far, and yet there's more to see. Am I just dumb for what I'm going through? Approach the door and give the knob a turn. Explosions of confetti all around. I duck, I roll, I jump and bounce and turn. What joy I hear, what mirth is in their sound. My papakin and mamakin both hop. 
their arms become a fearsome length so wide, they rapidly approach with ne'er a stop, revealing what they both have felt inside. I've gone away the earth I'd chose to roam, but nothing felt the same as coming home. Afterward My job as producer and editor during projects is frequently to stay out of the way. This project, the fifth that I've organized, is no exception. It's best to restrain myself in deference to the writers that watch more regularly. All I do is adjust their grammar. The premise and the thematic foil I made to inspire ideas are absent. The road trip was supposed to encompass the world, but the stories are all coincidentally set in the eastern United States. Pippa's transformation takes her to the west, but we writers chase her shadow in the east. What happens when the sun sets? I may be asked what's the point of this project, what justifies it, as though it must align with the corporate calendar. Why should anyone care? It's a fair question. When I approach professional writers with complete characters and themes, I may not compel them to create. I'm frequently ignored by anyone that I wish to work with. But I am always impressed by the creative spirit of capitalists. They are compelled, not by me, but by Pippa, because she's someone worth writing about. Before Pippa moved west, there was an air of transformation. I am stepping into the next chapter of myself. She was moving joyfully again to self-improve, and I thought it was interesting. It should be celebrated, if nothing else, because it's easy to get stuck. We can never be happy by lingering at the start line. Stagnating there only creates resentment of the world and of ourselves. There's motion which gives emotion purpose. We go places so we can feel something. It may be wonder, it may be melancholy, or whatever feeling is right for us. We may drift off the beaten path or make mistakes, but we will hopefully be better for it. We may return home once upon a time, which is never to say that we're done. Who we were is always relevant to who we are, and such a truth should be respected. As everyone changes, I hope that our relationships improve and that we honor where we came from. I encourage people to create. This is your moment to do so. You don't need permission. You don't need a special occasion. You don't need a grant or a scholarship or an academic degree. Give it your best, collect all the memories that you can, and put them on your wall. Love, son of sonnet. The end.